I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. In this video, I'm going to continue uh, and actually complete the discussion of Chapter 2 of Ayn Rand's Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology. Um, this lecture will conclude uh, Chapter 2 of her discussion of the Introduction to Epistemology. Um, the video shouldn't be that long. Um, there's only a few things that I have left to discuss, and then I will continue the analysis in the next series of video um, on chapter three, which is the abstraction of abstractions. So I'm going to conclude uh, chapter two video, and then I'll move on to chapter three. Okay. So in um, in this discussion in chapter two, what we what we recognize is that Rand has been trying to give us um, an understanding of a few sort of seminal, essential concepts. Um, we should, at this point, understand what a unit is and how she technically defines a unit. We should understand how she defines a concept. We should understand how she defines measurement. We should understand how she um, defines and classifies um, the idea of uh, differentiation and integration. A lot of these concepts um, are important, are essential in understanding how she goes about um, constructing her epistemology and specifically how we go about formalizing concepts. Chapter 2, in a sense, if you think about it, um, as far as the narrative is concerned, Chapter 2 is an introduction to concept formation. Chapter 3 is a more advanced version of, con a, 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 um, a supremely more, uh, um, um, indefinitely more advanced version of concept formation. In the analysis, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we have an understanding of how she goes about this um, idea of concept formation. And she does this by closing the chapter with uh, the idea of the uh, conceptual common denominator. Right. So we're going to look at what it means to talk about the conceptual common denominator, what that is, um, and how it factors into her epistemology. Okay, so this is Rand and Rand. So this is Ayn Rand's Objectivist Epistemology, and this is uh, the final section of Chapter 2, Chapter 2.3. Okay. Um, she introduces this idea of the conceptual common denominator. conceptual common denominator. Um, also before I begin, the notes that I'm going to be using to guide the discussion, um, I've made them available to you. If you want to follow along in the notes, print out the notes, um, just click the, the banner that will pop up on the video or the description, the link in the description field, it'll take you to the notes. Also, um, I'm, if you want to go through the playlist, there's a link on the PDF to the playlist of all the videos um, on the topic of Anne Rand's uh, introduction to Objectivist Epistemology. So, you know, print it out and follow along if you like. Okay, um, so the question is, what is this conceptual common denominator? Um, she defines it as this, and this is a direct, a direct quote. She says, the conceptual common denominator is defined as the characteristics reducible to a unit, the characteristic reducible to a unit of measurement by which man differentiates two or more existence from other existence possessing it. Conceptual common denominator. I'll read that again. The characteristic reducible to a unit of measurement, okay, so we think of a unit of measurement. The example that I've been giving throughout the discussion would be, for example, the unit of measurement here would be length, longer than this, shorter than this, and so on. So, a characteristic reducible to a unit of measurement the measurement we'll discuss in this case is length, by which man differentiates two or more existence from other existence possessing it. So with respect to length, two or more existence, this possesses length, this possesses length, the possession of this length is longer than the possession of this length, which is shorter than. Very, very simple. Um, so the question then becomes what is this common denominator? In the discussion, in that description, she says, existence possessing it, and it refers to the 
attribute, right? The attribute. Um, so what we recognize then in this account for Rand that the concepts that we formulate, right? The concepts that we formulate actually refer to things in the world, right? The concepts that we have in our mind refer to, and this is what um, is going to begin the, the discussion in chapter three. I'm not going to get to it yet, but um, this idea that concepts refer, the concepts refer to perceptual um, entities, right? They, they refer to things in the world. So, for example, if I have the idea of infinity, right? The question is, does infinity refer to a metaphysical thing in the world, right? And the question is, infinity itself does not refer to a metaphysical thing in the world that can be ostensibly defined, right? For Rand, infinity would not refer to a metaphysical fact in the world, a perceptual um, entity, because there is the, the, the concept of infinity transcends our perceptual ability. So the question is, well, how would a concept, the concept of infinity, refer to a perceptual entity? Well, obviously you get to the, the notion of infinity a number of ways. One, of, one, one way in which that you can get to the idea of infinity is sort of the addition of um, whole number integers, right? One, two, three, four, dot, 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 onto the infinity, right? Um, this idea of length, this idea of distance, this idea of, of, of number, all of these are attributes of objects in the world, right? So I might get to the, there's many, there's an infinity of ways that I can get to the concept of infinity. I don't want to explain that now, but you can imagine that I have uh, one Rubik's Cube, two Rubik's Cubes, three Rubik's Cubes, and so on. I keep on adding, um, I keep on adding these things together and I recognize that I can get to uh, an infinity of Rubik's Cubes so that the, the concept of infinity in that example of Rubik's Cubes can point to the actual perceptual entity within the world. And what I'm doing is I'm duplicating. All I'm really doing in order to get to um, the idea of infinity is a duplication And actually, it would be an infinite duplication. Infinite duplication of, and the question is what? Of what? Perceptual entities. So that I can arrive at the concept of infinity through the infinite duplication of perceptual entities. Whatever, and it can be anything. Infinite duplication of, of, uh, of um, Rubik's Cubes, infinite duplication of cars, infinite duplication of what have you. Right, so that I can arrive at this concept, this very abstracted concept of infinity, by recognizing that the concept is itself derived from an infinite, and I don't actually infinitely have to do it, I just have to recognize that it could theoretically be infinite, an infinite duplication of perceptual entities, and I subsequently arrive at the concept of infinity. Right? So what she's saying is the relationship between the concept and the the I'll, I'll get, I don't want to give the technical term yet because that's in chapter three, but the relationship between the, the concept and the conceptual, uh, the um, perceptual entity is one in which there, it's, it's inextricable, right? You can't have concept formation without the, and its association to perceptual entities, right?